Thank you, and uh, thank everybody. Thank you all for sticking around despite the very long um, gap when you could have easily escaped. <laughs> so, um, this is a totally different talk than I uh, said I was going to talk on. So, if you're interested in integer partitions, I'm happy to talk to you about that. But um, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So, this is joint work with. Um, my current student, Sarah Cannon, who's here, and former student, Sarah Myrickel, um, who's at the University of St. Thomas. And it only now occurs to me, it's a little bit like George Foreman naming all of his children George. <laughs> but, you know. um, okay, so this is what I'm going to be looking at. A class of, imagine you have an n by n square, and you're dividing it into n rectangles, lattice rectangles, of area n. Okay, so um, all of the uh, vertices of the rectangles lie on lattice points. Um, I'm pretending that it actually has some applications. And um, okay, and th this is the Markov chain I'm going to look at. You choose an edge, and if that's an edge that could be flipped, rotated uh, 90 degrees, then then you do that, right? So. I guess this has a pointer somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. Okay. Um, then, then you could make this move. I'm hoping that those of you who have been here for the whole workshop, this looks familiar. Um, okay. So the questions that make sense to ask is, um, does this even connect the state space? Okay. So for triangulations, which we looked at previously, it's easier to show. Here, it's really not obvious. And in fact, the first thing you'll realize is that n has to be a power of 2, or this makes no sense. So if you try, if you look at this configuration, there's no move you could possibly do. So we're going to always assume that n is 2 to the k. And then you know, the question that we'll really be looking at is, is this chain rapidly mixing? Does it mix in polynomial time? Um, OK, and I just want to point out that this exact edge flip chain comes up in a lot of different settings. So um, the most obvious is domino tiling. So this is the dual to um, perfect matchings on the Cartesian lattice. And if you look at it in terms of actual thick dominoes, you're just taking the middle edge and rotating it. It's exactly the same edge flip chain. This was the one that we saw a couple of talks on earlier in the week, which was lattice triangulations. Again, you remove the edge and you try to put it back um, in the other orientation. Um, the other two things I'm comparing it to are a little bit different, but I want to just sort of point out the similarity. This is lozenge tiling. So here, you're taking, um, you're not moving a single edge, you're actually taking a Y shape and rotating it to an upside down Y. And I'm saying it's similar because really the similarity here, at least, is that you're taking faces and you're alternating edges. Your moves are switching um, the edges around some face, as it is for, there's been work, um, they, it's called fortresses because of the dual problem, but this is just a perfect matching on the square octagon lattice. And if I wanted to generate a random one, I can choose a face and if the edges around the face alternating are part of the matching, I could rotate it to the other one and this connects the state space. All right. So the top two are known to be polynomially mix mixing. The bottom two we don't know. And um, you know, as we saw, there's a lot of work on this question um, in the unweighted case. This one is almost definitely slowly mixing. And um, there's been some work on weighted models that show when the weights are high, this is slow, and when they're fast, um, when it's low, it's fast, and in between, we don't know, and this is unfortunately in between. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit, let me just remind you what we had for um, triangulations. Okay. Um, so in general, you could ask this question where the vertices are not necessarily on lattice points and look for a random triangulation. And this is a problem that a lot of people in graphics are interested in. This is open. It's been solved if the vertices are all in convex positions, say um, the vertices of a convex n-gon, um, where you know, all the combinatorics are solved also. So you could generate these things in other ways as well. But this edge flipping chain is fast in that case. Um, we saw already that triangulations of regions on ZD, this is still open. Um, but there's this very nice work by Caputo um, and collaborators who are all here um, that looks at the weighted setting. Okay, so what they show is this. OK, 
Okay, so they weight the configuration by lambda to the total edge length, and they consider this Markov chain. And they show that when lambda is greater than one, you have exponential time convergence. When lambda is less than one, it seems fast, and they show it rigorously up to some lower value, lambda zero. And there's a lot of evidence, certainly including the work that Alex talked about, that suggests that it's going to be fast all the way up to one. But this is the current state. <coughs> okay. So this motivated our question, um, which is, you know, really, when I heard about that work when they were doing it, I thought, you know, you could probably see the same effect if you consider rectangles instead, which is why we started thinking about this. So it's a, a lot less rich of a problem. You're not going to get these shears in many different directions like you do with triangulations. But in terms of demonstrating this type of phase transition, this seemed like a simpler model to look at. Um, so, yeah. sorry, let me go back. So again, I'm going to take lambda to the entire to the total edge length of my rectangulation. So long thin ones have longer length and square root n by root n rectangles have um, smaller perimeter or you know, smaller exponent. Okay? And here are two examples. So this is when lambda is less than one, you're favoring squares. Right? When lambda is greater than one, you're favoring long thin ones. And the long thin ones are going to align vertically or they're going to align horizontally, and that suggests that you're going to have a phase transition. OK, so this was my intuition. It turns out to be completely wrong. So we'll see why later. But hopefully, this is at least suggesting that there's, it's not completely wrong. <laughs> All right. Um, OK, so I'm interested in how fast. Um, OK, so I want to know, does the um, edge flip chain even connect the state space? is I have to answer first, OK, before I even look at things like mixing. And I just want to point out that, I mean, these pictures might not make it obvious, but it's not obvious that there's always a single move you can do. OK, so for there to be a single move, for, for there to be a move, you have to have two identical rectangles next to each other. Completely not obvious to us that that's always the case. OK, so our first result is that the edge flip chain does connect the state space. OK, so the whole mixing question makes sense. Um, we'll converge to the uniform distribution if you do that. OK, so again, it's not obvious that there's a move. Um, it's a double induction that I credit Sarah for <laughs> that ended up every time we thought we had it, there was a counterexample. It's really messy. And so we do induction on something we call H regions. So H is a power of 2. And all of the rectangles within an H region have height at most H. And all of the vertical walls are a multiple of h. So that defines these subregions. And if you have um, some tall regions or some you know, tall things, we're going to try to retile it with um, uh, rectangles that have half the height and convert it into an h over 2 region. OK, so it's sort of an involved um, induction. And this is not, I'm not going to go through this anymore, but there is a proof that this connects the state space. Um, OK, so I want to look at this question. And it turns out that it's, um, we were really stuck on this for a while. And you'll see by the end of the talk why this is actually maybe not the right question to ask. So we're going to switch instead to a restricted subset of the tilings, which are called dyadic tilings, or a, a subset of the dissections, which are called dyadic tilings. So I'm going to just take a few minutes and tell you about, first define them, because you need to know what they are. But also, they have this just beautiful combinatorial structure. And I'm just going to give you some background on dyadic tilings, because they're really lovely. Okay, Then we'll consider the general case. All right, so a dyadic rectangle is a rectangle whose height and, um, whose height and width are both dyadic intervals. Sorry, I mean, you might have already said that A has a? What's A? Well, the area of each. Yes, everything is a power of 2. Exactly, right. So the, I have uh, 2 to the k by 2 to the k square, and I'm filling it with um, 2 to the k is n. So n rectangles of area n. So it won't connect the state space if n is not a power of 2. Yeah. OK, so I'm restricting to a subset of the rectangulations where each rectangle, both dimensions are dyadic. So 
Dyadic intervals are, this is formally what it is, but it's something where you're going from, um, you know, a over two to the b to a plus one over two to the b. And if you think about the kind of ruler function, if you connect the tops of this line and this line, you don't cross anything in between, but here you do, and so this is not dyadic. You can't express it in that reduced form as a, a over two to the b and a plus one over two to the b. Okay. So just to be clear, a dyadic tiling, all of these rectangles are dyadic. Here we have the dark ones are not dyadic rectangles because they have intervals which are not dyadic. So obviously this is a very small subset of the rectangular dissections. Okay? But it turns out that the same edge flip chain does connect the set of dyadic tilings. So we're gonna look at that first. And here the proof is very easy, unlike the general case. Um, and I should say that um, it's, it's obvious and probably doesn't need an attribution, but this is something that I did with um, Svante Janssen and Joel Spencer a while ago. Okay, so here's the most important theorem in dyadic rectangles that lets you do everything else, or dyadic tilings, is that every dyadic tiling has a fault line that's either horizontal and bisects the, the rectangle and doesn't cross any rectangles, or a horizontal one. It's a, as soon as you play with it, you'll see. It might have both, okay? And once you realize that, um, if AK is the number of tilings um, with two, okay, so I'm just scaling down. So it has two to the K rectangles of area two to the minus K. So this is now a unit square. I just changed the scaling. Then a theorem of um, Kaufman and company and Ligarius Spence and, and company is that um, if you start, there's a very simple recurrence. So um, A0 is one. A1, um, if you're having, um, if you're dividing it with one dividing line, you could either do it horizontally or vertically, so there's two. And the recursion is that for AK, if you divide it this way, you can take the left side and rescale it, right? So you dilate, dilate it to a square again, and you have um, a dyadic tiling of one lower order. So all of your rectangles double in size, but you get another one back of the smaller order. So you have um, AK minus one squared for vertical. You have AK minus one squared if you divide it horizontally. And we've overcounted by the ones that have both. So you subtract off AK minus two to the fourth, where you would have to dilate. Um, you would have to stretch in both directions. <laughs> okay, so we have this very simple um, recurrence. It should look familiar, and you know we know that it's the golden mean to the end. So we know everything about the number of dyadic tilings, including the asymptotic um, behavior. And so, if you wanted to sample these, um, you could choose vertical or horizontal, right? And then on each side, if you choose vertical, you could choose horizontal or vertical with the right probabilities, and you just do this recursively, recursively, and you're producing what we call a VH tree, okay? And the only restriction on these, it's not all possibilities, we're going to say that if something divides both ways, we're going to allow a V with two H's as children, and we're never going to allow an H with two V's as children. So this resolves the ambiguity. And then conditioned on this, there's a bijection between these labeled binary trees um, and the tilings. So you could figure out exactly the probability to put V or H in a given place, and you could just generate these. And you could also do it for the infinite tilings. You could do windows of the infinite tilings. Okay. Um, but we looked then at this edge flip chain, <coughs> sorry, in the context of um, dyadic tilings, and it's still open. We don't know how to do it. But we did find a different Markov chain that's rapidly mixing, and I'm just gonna show you what it is. It's you choose this blue window is a dyadic rectangle of larger size, and everything in it, we can rotate at 90 degrees and rescale as necessary to, re, to put that tiling back in. So if you look at what's here, these two become these two long thin ones and these two become these two. So all I did is I took this and I rotated it to the left and I got a new tiling. So this is a chain that I could implement in polynomial time and it turns out that it's 
really simple to show that this chain is rapidly mixing. Okay, but it doesn't tell us anything about the edge flip chain, unfortunately. Um, okay. So the same thing that I showed you before, we're going to consider these weighted versions where the weight of a tiling is going to be lambda to the total edge length. And here are some samples. Um, so again, you see something that is suggestive where here your guess is correct. Um, you're going to have a lot of squares when lambda is less than one and things should mix quickly. You're going to have a lot of long, thin rectangles when lambda is greater than one, and things should mix slowly because you won't go from a predominantly vertical configuration to a predominantly horizontal one. And at one, who knows? <laughs> and this is what we show. So the work with um, Sarah Cannon and Sarah Meyerkel, we show that we have polynomial mixing all the way up to the critical point, and then exponential mixing all the way beyond the critical point. So this is what was suggested from the triangle the triangular triangulation picture. Um, but here we're able to show it all the way to the critical point. Okay. Um, okay. So what about general rectangular dissections? All right, so this is in the case that all of your, rec your um, rectangles were restricted to have be dyadic intervals. Here, the picture is much more complicated. I mean, even showing connectivity was much more complicated. Um, any guesses? <laughs> uh, here's the picture. So we have exponential mixing below one. We have exponential mixing above one for a totally different reason. And we don't know about one, but I actually suspect that it's fast at one. Okay. Um, so hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll explain why. Um, I mean, at a high level, uh, above one, you're going to be slow starting anywhere. And below one, you're probably fast if you start at a good place. So there are going to be some places that are slow. So when I say it's slow mixing, it's, um, there's qualitative differences in what I mean by that. Okay. so. My goal is to prove these theorems to you. So in the dyadic case, I want to show that you have this phase transition. And in the other case, I want to show that it's exponential above and below. Okay. Um, what proportion of all of them are the dyadic ones? Uh, trivial. I mean, so you could, um, there's at least, um, yeah, I mean, there's an exponential number of each. The exponential in the case of dyadic tilings is the golden mean because you solve that recurrence. And it's a larger, I mean, you have a much larger number in the case of general. We don't have good bounds, but we have crude bounds that show it's much larger. So we have, I think it's um, log n to the n as a lower bound. So it's different. Yeah, Tom? Is there, is there a formula for the number of general dissections? Yeah. In fact, one might say that we're interested in sampling so that we could estimate that. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, we're saying it in n by n regions, so unless you generalize that definition, it's not self-reducible, but presumably it is. So you uh, think about lambda greater than 1, what if you took that vh3 and flipped all these to hs and hs all to vs? I mean, that's one thing that's stopping you from mixing. Um, you would violate the condition that I had this asymmetry where I said you could have a V with two H children, but not an H with two V children. I see. Yeah, you would. I mean, so, I mean, you would get a different, I mean, you would have to have a different, mm -hmm. you would have to compensate for that, yeah. Well, I'm going to show you that, um, I see, at the high, yeah, I mean, there are definitely, I mean, my guess, honestly, a different way of saying what you're saying is what if we um, add, moves that allow you to take subregions and rotate by 90 degrees. I suspect this is fast. What if you take subregions and rotate by 180 degrees? This will still be slow, but I suspect this one is fast. And we've done simulations, and I'll show you at the end. So there's very closely related chains that will draw out the differences between these two exponential regions. But yeah, I agree that that should break the symmetry. OK. So um, this is in 
the green, the one green <laughs> bar that I have, which is lambda less than one, where I'm favoring squares in the dyadic restricted case. Um, okay, so in this case, um, we show that we have n squared log n mixing, and um, our proof technique is exactly what um, they did with the triangulations. It's exactly the same strategy. We're going to, we have this exponential metric essentially defined. Um, that must be another G. Oh. <laughs> It is. I just changed it. I had just letters, and then I, congratulations, Catherine. Greenberg, <laughs> Pasco, and Randall, I apologize. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, right. So if we have two configurations that differ by an edge move, the distance between them is lambda to the difference in their lengths. And um, we show that there's a coupling that gets closer together in expectation at each step and the rest is standard, okay? So the, the trick here is defining this metric so that you could show that there's contraction in expectation, and then we use the um, original bubbly dyer um, multiplicative version of the path coupling lemma gives this to you. All right. So this is pretty standard. Um, for both of them, I'm gonna be able to show that when lambda is greater than one, this is the regime where you're favoring long, thin rectangles. It's the same proof in both cases. Um, we're going to show that the chain is slow, okay? So, um, right, so we're gonna show that it's exponential in n squared, the mixing at least. Okay, so we're going to show that there's a bottleneck in the state space so that it's hard to cross from one side to the other because you have this exponential um, constriction. So, um, what are my, the left set is going to be that there's at least one long, thin rectangle. The right set is going to be that there's, oh, I'm saying the middle first. The right set is going to be that you have a wide um, rectangle going all the way across. And the middle set is you have none of those, okay? And this is a partition. And moreover, to get from here to here, you have to pass through this middle set. Okay, so you have to kind of reason that through, but it's, Pretty straightforward. Okay, and then we do very crude estimates. I mean, these are really simple. So, um, if you have at least one, um, oh, right. This set includes the all vertical, um, the configuration where everything is vertical. This is the weight of that one configuration. So the weight of the entire set is at least that. On the right side, um, we have the configuration that is all horizontal, which has this weight. So the weight of the right side is at least this. The middle side, you have to be a little bit careful, but the largest size of any rectangle, the largest perimeter is if it's half the height because it can't be the entire height. All right, so this is the largest size of any rectangle. And this is the, um, the number of configurations you could have Okay, so namely, you take your lower left corner that has not yet been mapped to um, a rectangle, and it's part of a rect it's the lower left corner of one of log n different rectangles. Okay, that, I mean, the, we have log n different rectangles that could possibly be part of the tiling. You take that out, and then you choose the lexicographically lowest point remaining, and you do the same thing. So this is an upper bound on the number of possible rectangular tilings, so it's an upper bound and not a lower bound, which is what I said before. But um, this is enough to show you that you have an exponential difference and you have a bad cut, okay? So this was pretty um, straightforward. <coughs> this was the one that um, was surprising to us, so it's probably still a little bit of a myster mystery. Why? When lambda is less than one, so this is the case where we're favoring squares, um, why should this be slow? All right, so this is what I'm going to try to show. And um, so what happens, and we didn't realize this until we did simulations, is that if you have a configuration that has two long, thin rectangles, remember, those are the ones we want to get rid of right away, right? The, the favorable configurations don't have any of these when lambda is less than one. But if they're separated 
they have to be next to each other to annihilate them, right? So if they're next to each other, we can do an edge move. But if they're far apart, we can't get rid of one of them until we introduce more rectangles in order to move them closer or to do something um, where we could get rid of it, right? Okay, so this is the problem. Um, so if you have two separated bars. Um, it turns out that like everything we tried in order to show a bad cut in the state space still didn't work. Um, it, it was sort of challenging to figure out how to characterize this. Um, we could show that you know the middle set had to have lower weight, but we weren't able to show an exponential, exponentially small cut until we realized that if things are separated at some precise distances, then you also have to have a lot of things at the next smaller scale and so forth. Okay, so uh, the binary representation of the distance is significant in showing a lower bound on what the weight has to be. And so here was the, what we ended up showing. Okay, so we define the separation as if you have at least two verticals, the long, the long, you know, the tallest possible um, bars, there has to be an even number, and I'm going to pair them up in order. And the separation is the distance between this pair plus the distance between this pair. Okay. Um, you know, and intuitively, the separation is what matters. It doesn't really matter how far these are apart, because these two have to get closer together to annihilate, and they're sort of going to interact with each other. You know, there's definitely a parity thing going on here. So our middle set here is going to be configurations that have at least four vertical bars and separation exactly equal to n over 2 plus 2. <laughs> it's like this really precise, crazy little set. Um, our left set is going to be things that have separation at least n over 2 plus 2. And um, yeah, so it, it's at least this and um, it should be strictly greater unless there are two bars, okay? So, and this set is um, when the separation is less, okay? So everything that does not have these long, thin bars, which is the majority of the state space, is all in this giant set, okay? So um, in this case, there's a definite asymmetry, but if you think about it, if you have something which has large separation, either it has a lot of bars or it just has two bars that are well separated, um, all you can do with edge flip moves, if you're going to change the signature in terms of the um, long thin bars, is you could move them two at a time closer together. Okay, so you could introduce another, so you're, you're moving up or down by some very small amount and that means that um, if this is separation which is larger and you're moving to separation which is smaller, you have to go through the set. And if you have two bars that are well separated, you have to get to this amount with four vertical bars. Okay, so it sounds like overly technical, but um, you really need this kind of structure. All right. Um, this n, I mean, we could have put any distance here would have partitioned the state space. This distance was chosen precisely so that. Um, if we write out the binary representation of the distance, we're going to have a lot of ones, which means that you, um, you have these two things that are well separated, but you can't fill in the in-between thing with squares, okay? You have to have at least two n over two height rectangles above each other. You have to have at least two of those. And then what's remaining, you still can't fill in with squares. So you have to have some n over 4 sized rectangles. And you just do this by arguing over the dimensions of the space between. And with that, you're able to get enough structure that you can show that um, this set is exponentially smaller than either of the other two. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I went very fast, yeah. <laughs> Those initial conditions take exponential time to escape, but do you think that? What I said before is from a warm start, I think it's fast. I see. I, I think that lambda less than one will be fast from a warm start, and greater than one will, of course, be slow. 
Yeah. So, I mean, they, they are qualitatively different, or it would be really ridiculous to look at this picture and say, I think it's fast here, but I do. <laughs> Okay, so I think that at lambda equal to one, probably both of these are fast, um, which is what they believe in the triangulation case too, I think. Um, okay, so open questions is what happens at lambda equal to one, um, either for the dyadic case or the non-dyadic case. So remember that when lambda is equal to one, there is this other Markov chain which is fast, which says choose larger regions and rotate those, okay? which, by the way, is very similar to the chain that Ravi was suggesting, in the, you know, which is like choose pieces and try to, you know, this, this idea of rotation seems to be breaking the um, cut, the, the phase transition that says you're going to be largely vertical or largely horizontal. I mean, I think that should work. In the case of dyadic tilings, if you choose these rectangles to be any dyadic subregion, we do know it's fast here, but that doesn't tell us anything for the... Um, for the single edge flip, the original chain. Okay. Um, I also, you know, I talked about this earlier. So what if we allow 90 degree or 180 degree rotations with the appropriate stretching or shrinking to fit things in when it's still in the class, okay? So um, here are some simulations. Oops, I didn't do that. Um, so we started with, um, we, Sarah, started with, um, these are n equals 64, lambda is 0.8, okay? So um, at the, she started with the all vertical um, configuration, which doesn't have these two well-separated bars, but it's in the left set, that small set, that we would have to cross over to reach equilibrium. So, you know, after 20 million moves, you still have a fair number of verticals left. And then it starts smoothing out, and then after 60 million, it already looks like it's at equilibrium. You really get rid of these, these long, thin obstacles in either direction, and you have things that look mostly like squares. So um, I do think that if you add 180-degree rotations, I mean, if you think about it, we're, we're doing 180-degree rotations on any sub-rectangle. So if you have two long, thin rectangles that are separated, and you grab everything right next to one of them, in one move, you could get those next to each other. Okay, and that's the benefit. So when lambda is less than one, this is going to bring rectangles close together, and then you could annihilate them quickly. In the case where lambda is greater than one, it's not gonna help at all, because it's gonna map long, thin things to long, thin things, and it's not gonna help you, because you have a lot of them, and they're not going to disappear so quickly. Okay. Um, right, so, um, that was this question. I, you know, this idea of choosing sub rectangles and trying to do a rotation there, um, I thought about it a little bit and didn't really see what to do with it. But for people who are looking at triangulations, it might be possible to choose some convex region and rotate the triangulation within that and break symmetry. So there might be sort of an analog of this in the triangulation case. Um, you're going to have long, thin re regions, so that's not going to break those so easily, but it might be adding those moves, you'll get out of these sort of stuck situations where things are, are well sheared. You looked, have you thought about um, reflections of sub-rectangles? Reflections aren't going to help because it's all, I mean, unless I do reflections over um, the diagonal, because the whole... Th it, would, it would move, say, of, you know... Oh bars at the top and squares at the bottom, then you could flip those up at the top. It would yeah, just... okay, I think, it, I think it would have the same effect as the 180 degree rotation. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I thought you meant in the larger. Yeah, absolutely, I, I, I think it does. I mean, I think the only obstacle, I think it's an artifact for the general rectangulations is that you get stuck with these long, sep these, uh, long thin separated things that just can't reach each other. So anything you do to break that should help. Okay, um, and there's actually a lot of structure here. So there's, there's a lot of nice questions about, um, um, Alex referred to them in the talk when he was talking about triangulations. You know, can you say anything about decay of correlations in both of these regimes? Um, can you say anything about average edge length? And I imagine here these problems are far more tractable. 
Um, certainly in the dyadic setting where we really do get this nice phase transition. I mean, all of these problems, probably a lot of this is known already, in fact, but I haven't looked into it. So I think that, you know, to get intuition for the triangulation model, which I, again is a much richer model, I think this um, potentially is helpful. And that's it. So okay, thank you. It depends what you mean. It doesn't have the kind of structure, but the um, each square is associated with the log of the height of the rectangle it falls in, right? So, so you implicitly have a height function that when you talk about like the distance between two, you're looking at cell by cell at that difference. So, you know, there's something sort of implicit here, but. Um, um, I, I don't think there's anything that we can exploit in ways that we can for other models. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of the distance metric we're using to show that it's decreasing, is the difference in heights. One question. So, have you uh, considered sort of changing the square into a rectangle? You saw this, uh, this way out in front of you. Um, I, th I mean, I think you would have exactly the same, oh, well, actually, it might change what happens um, greater than um, one, but because you would have an asymmetry, but even there, I doubt it. I think you're going to get stuck in one or the other, but I don't know. But less than one, it's not going to make a difference, because you're still going to have these long, thin things that are well separated that you're not going to get rid of quickly in the general case. Right, and it, the dyadic case, I'm not sure even makes sense. So, yeah. Question. Um, so, along the same lines, what if it were a torus? Well, um, then things are not connected, right? So, I mean, you just you have a horizontal all the way across, and then the next one offset. So, the edge flip chain. I mean, you could ask, does is the edge flip chain in the region that's connected for the set of configurations that are connected. But I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I imagine it's similar. Any more questions? I think we should thank Brian again.